Well, I'm glad to see each of you here today, and I hope you have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We will get to that in just a second. Glad that you are here today. If you're visiting with us, we are thankful that you're here. If you have any questions while you're here, don't hesitate to ask. We will be happy to sit down and talk with you and give you an answer from the Bible. I want to start off by saying this. There are four times in the book of Daniel, this is Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, 25, and 32, and then Daniel chapter 5 and verse 21, where in the context of Daniel dealing with King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, Daniel reminds them that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives them to whomsoever he will. It's... I was on the way home from Branson last night and didn't know, well, I had heard, I guess in passing, I got a text from a friend of mine about what happened in Pennsylvania yesterday with the former president. It's hard to believe, isn't it? We're in 2024 and somebody's shooting at a president. It's hard to believe, but we need to be praying for our country, praying for our leaders, and that's exactly what Paul tells us to do. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, pray for them that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. That is God's will, according to that passage. And so, we need to be at the forefront of that, don't we? Praying to God for those things, for our leaders. Um, I thought about last night, perhaps, having a different sermon, and I thought, no, I need to... Well, what does James say? Be quick to hear and slow to speak. So I thought that might be some advisable, advisable counsel for myself. So we're going to maintain the same lesson that I had prepared. I want to study about the church of Christ, but I want to do it. I've, you guys know me. I've been here for 10 years, and I like to try to at times approach things from a different perspective. And you guys know as well as I do, truth doesn't change. I'm not teaching anything you've never heard before, but I want to maybe approach this from a different perspective in terms of a series on the Lord's church. A lot of times I've seen these start in the Old Testament, perfectly fine and legitimate and a good way to do it, but I don't. that's not where I want to start. I want to start on some things that I was thinking about. So let me start here by asking you a question. What, in your opinion, is the greatest proponent of division in the religious world? And by the religious world, I don't, I'm not including the world religions like Islam and Hinduism. I'm talking about within what we would refer to as Christendom. Okay, the world of people who believe that there is one God and that Jesus was his son, that Jesus died on the cross. Now, you know as well as I do, there are a lot of splinter groups within that, but there are a lot of people that fall in that category of particular belief. What, in your opinion, is the greatest driver of division within that system of belief? I've got four thoughts here. How about ignorance of the Bible? That's a big book, isn't it? 66 books, in fact, brought into one volume. Different types of narratives. You've got history, you've got law, You've got poetry, you've got prophecy, you have figurative language, you have all different genres of literature that are used. There is a lot of information in that book you're holding in your hand. But you have it. So think just two verses I thought of in terms of ignorance. I always think of Hosea 4.6. Hosea is written approximately the time of Isaiah, about 700 years or so before the birth of Christ and why were the people of Hosea's day condemned? My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. But I want you to listen to the rest of that verse. That's the, just the first segment. Because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from being, uh, over, uh, from, well, essentially from being my people. But listen to that. You have rejected knowledge. It's not that it wasn't there. It's not that a knowledge of God's will was not accessible to them. They rejected it. All right? Turn to the New Testament in your mind. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. When for the time you ought to be teachers, 
You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And you become need as you become such as have need of milk and not solid food. Well, it's because you are unskilled in the word of righteousness. Ignorance could be a major driver in religious division, couldn't it? Because people just don't know the truth. All right. How about this one? Various interpretations. Whether we like to admit it or not, everybody who reads the Bible has to interpret it. Now, here's the thing about that. The Bible even speaks on that issue. There's a right way to do it, and there are ways that are not right to do it. Notice how I said that. There is a right way to do it, a right way. There are many wrong ways to do it. That's why we have 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, The King James says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing is one word in the Greek language, and it means, like if you've ever used a skill saw and you've popped a chalk line, you know what that looks like, don't you? That's what that word means. You cut it straight. There's a right way to interpret Scripture. There are many wrong ways to interpret Scripture. And what we need to know is that there are not a multiplicity of right ways to do it. You either handle Scripture correctly or you don't. That's a major proponent or driver, let's say, of division in the religious world. How about familial religious tradition? And I think of 1 Peter chapter 1. You were redeemed not with silver and gold or with the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Family tradition is... Significant to a lot of people. Um, and it's hard to, hard to let that go sometimes. Because, well, it's, what it is really is an emotional attachment. My mom taught me this. My dad taught me this. My grandparents did this. And here's, so here's an objection I've been, that I've encountered over the years in studying the Bible with people and trying to show them the truth. Well, my grandparents didn't know this stuff. So you're telling me my grandparents are going to go to hell because they didn't know what you're telling me? All right. How would you answer that? Number one, I'm not telling you anything about your grandparents. I don't know your grandparents. Number two, if your grandparents knew that you had an opportunity to know and obey the truth, what do you think they would want you to do? Do you think that they would want you to follow what they had always believed just because they had always believed it? Or do you think they might want you to know the truth and do what's right? If if what they did was wrong, let's say. Well, family tradition is a major driver of division in the religious world. How about deconstruction? What? You know what construction is. What is deconstruction? This is... This is where, spiritually speaking, this is the process where typically, well, not typically, seems typical, but younger people go through, I would say, kind of surface level, all the things they've ever been taught and they tear it down. And they reject their, essentially what they reject is their familial tradition. And it, it happens in all religious, in all, let's say, Christian faiths. But it happens within the Lord's church, too. And just by way of example. You know, there's no commandment in your New Testament. There's no direct commandment in your New Testament to take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Do you know that? How did you come to that conclusion? In deconstruction, what you do is you you look at the belief and the practice and you pull it apart by saying... I don't like how you came to that conclusion. It doesn't make any sense. Now, we have examples of of what they did in the first century, don't we? We know what they did. And I tell you, one of the benefits of reading history, particularly the second and third century histories of the early church, is they tell us what they did exactly. And not only the the Christians who were writing in those early centuries, but you you have antagonists towards Christianity writing the same thing about what those early Christians were doing. And telling you exactly what it looked like. We know what 
was done because obviously, first and foremost, because of Scripture, but we also have those historical accounts that are written for us. Well, deconstruction is a cause of division, and that one really, is, I would say, obviously within the church, but family, that's caused a lot of family issues too within the body of Christ. I want to show you something here, and this is something I've talked about frequently. I want you to see if you can see a difference and if there is any significance in what you see here. Do you see a difference? So what? what? What's the point? Let's talk about this for, for a couple of minutes. And you've heard me talk about this many times over the years. But it, we need to have this firmly in our minds. Are you a Church of Christ Christian? I don't want you to answer me because I don't want to know your answer. Answer that within your head. Are you a Church of Christ Christian? Are you a Church of Christer Are you, did you grow up? This is probably the one I hear the most. I grew up Church Christ. What does that mean? <laughs> I know typically what people mean when they say that, but we need to think about what we're saying. The difference is that one is a title. One is a religious title. And the other is a biblical description of the body of Christ. That's the difference. And if you and I don't know that difference then we have a problem. I am not a Church of Christ Christian. I am, and I've told you this before. And it's 100% true. I'm not a Church of Christ preacher. Because what happens when you start doing that? What happens when you start naming things like that? Well, to name things, if you were to look up the term denominationalism in the Bible, or denominate, what are you doing? You're naming various things. Sects, S-E-C-T-S, groups, parties, all right? And that's kind of the idea here. What that is, and I started, when I was putting this PowerPoint together, I started, I was doing what I normally do. I've got things on my um, legal pad I'm writing out. I'm typing, and I started to type this one out. Division is a violation of the will of God. And I, I sat there and I thought about that for a minute, and I thought, no. Division is not a violation against the will of God. And I'm going to show you the difference. Sectarianism. And by definition, sectarianism is an attachment to a particular sect or party, especially in religion. Sit, th think about when you sit down and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you read about different sects within Judaism in the gospel accounts? You ever heard of the Pharisees? You ever heard of the Sadducees, the Zealots, Simon the Zealot, the Essenes, the Herodians? Those are all sects within a, you might say, underneath an umbrella or the umbrella of Judaism. Sectarianism is a violation of the will of God. So you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 10 was read a few minutes ago, so let's read it again and we'll go all the way down through verse 15. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I'm trying to emphasize certain words. Now you've, and you've heard me talk about this too over the years. The, the first century church did not have to deal with Protestant denominationalism did it. The first century church didn't have to address the question of Roman Catholicism, Presbyterianism, Methodism, Baptist, Episcopalian, you name it. The first century church didn't have to deal with that question. Well, then what's Paul talking about here? For it has been declared unto me of you, about you, my brethren, by those who are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. There was only one church in the city of Corinth. There is, no, there is no evidence that there were multiple congregations in that one city. The only place that we see that happening is in, and you've heard me say this before too, Galatia. Galatia's not a, Galatia is not a city. It's a region that contains many cities. Lystra, Derby, Iconium, 
these places you read about in Acts chapters 13 and 14. And so when you open to the book of Galatians, Paul writes, to the churches of Galatia. But when you read about the church of God, which is at Corinth, or the church of Christ at Rome, etc., there was one congregation per city. There are contentions among you, the church within Corinth. Now this I say, so here's, he's describing what's going on. <coughs> Every one of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, another name for Peter, and I am of Christ. And he has three questions that are rhetorical. They answer themselves. Is Christ divided? What's the answer to that question? No. Was Paul crucified for you? No, he's writing the letter. Were you baptized into the name of Paul? No. <coughs> Excuse me. So three questions, and the answer is the same to every question. That's the problem, particularly right there at the end of verse 13. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? That's the source of the contention in Corinth. I thank God that I baptized none of you, except Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. That was the cause of the division. That's why he's calling them to be of the same mind, of the same judgment, no divisions, be perfectly joined together. Because we're all baptized into Christ. And again, he's not addressing different brands of Christianity that we have to address today. Folks, that's 1,500 years after Paul wrote this letter. At least. I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Paul didn't sit down and break out a scroll and a quill and start writing down the names of the people he baptized. Why not? Because Paul, the Lord didn't send me to baptize. Why? Why did he send him according to verse 17? To preach the gospel. Verse 17 is not an argument against the necessity of baptism. He's addressing a specific problem in Corinth. And he's, he's saying, I'm thankful that more people aren't trying to follow my name just because I had baptized them. Now we know that, we know the importance of baptism. That's not the point of this subject. <clears throat> the point of this sermon. But notice again that language in verse 10. How let's say, tightly knit or unified the body of Christ is. Sectarianism is a violation of the will of God. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. I, I guess, guys, what I was, as you're turning to Ephesians chapter 4, what I was thinking about in developing this series of lessons was we've got to start out on the right ground. And I don't know, and again, this is just my opinion. A lot of guys have done it differently over the years, but... <clears throat> You've got to start out on the speaking of the same thing. I don't think, I didn't want to jump into the Old Testament and start with Daniel chapter. We'll get there. But you've got to be on the same level and understand, first of all, this concept of the sinfulness of sectarianism. Ephesians 4.1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation with which you have been called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Look at verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The Greek word for endeavoring, striving, putting forth great effort into maintaining the unity of the body. The unity of the Spirit, rather, and the bond of peace. And look at the very first of the seven ones that he mentions. What is it? There's one what? Body. Isn't that what it says? There is one body. Now, we've done this before in Ephesians, but let's run through it again. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 22. Speaking of God and what he's done for Christ, God has put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is what? His body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. In other words, if you are in the body of Christ, if you are in the church for which Christ died, you are not lacking anything. It is the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. The book of Colossians deals with that extensively. You are complete in Him. Colossians 2 and verse 9, uh, uh, 2 and verse 10. You don't need anything else. Again, you look at the religious division about us and 
It's, well, it's, it's purely consumerism. It's spiritualized, but it's consumerism. Look for the church that, where you can, you know, the, fits you best, that you prefer the most. That's, that's consumerism. He's the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Okay? So back to 4.4. There is one body. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse... Oh, we'll start in verse 23, let's say. Verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore... As the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Do you notice in all the times... Well, okay, then down to verse 29. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord of the church. I don't know, I didn't count it, but how many times does Paul word the, use the word church there? And every single time you notice it's in the singular, isn't it? And you take your mind back to what Jesus said in Matthew 16. I will build my possessive church, singular. It wasn't a buffet line of churches. It was a church for which Christ died, over which Christ is head. And if you have been obedient to the gospel, of which you are a member, he is the head of the body of the church. He is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. And again, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, there is one body. So go back to chapter 4 and verse 4. All right? So this is where division comes in, because people say, (laughs) back to my first slide, well, that's not how I interpret that. There's not just one church. There's a lot of, there are a lot of churches, right? And that's a true statement. There are a lot of churches. Yeah, that's a true statement. There's one body. There's one spirit. How many Holy Spirits are there? As far as I can tell, there's one. Okay. There's one hope. There's one Lord. There's one faith. One baptism. And get, get down to this one. One God. Do you believe there's only one God? Let me ask you, why do you believe there's only one God? You ever read the Bible? Go back to, what is it, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. I mean, this goes all the way back to Moses and his writings in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens. Why do you believe there's one God? Because, well, his word tells me so. Then why don't you believe there's only one body? Well, I just don't see it that way. If you can do that with the one body, I can do that with one God. I just don't see it that way. Because the same book that tells me there's one God tells me there's only one church. Now, that's either true or false. There's no middle ground here. So, sectarianism is a violation of the will of God. Take your Bibles now to Philippians chapter 1. I think part of the problem is I think, it, you know, you go back to family tradition, but I think part of the problem is just our lived experience. It's just all we've ever seen, isn't it? And I know some of you sitting in here this morning came out of denominationalism. I know that. It's just, it's just a part of the reality of our existence. There are a bunch of churches, but could you imagine living in a time where there's not? There's just, there's just the church. And there's just one congregation in every city. Wouldn't that be weird? I mean, how many places have you been? We lived in Pensacola for seven and a half years, preached there. And I counted one time. And it, they fill up the spectrum. You can find anything you want within a church of Christ in Pensacola. I, if I remember right, the number was like 13 or 14 within the city of Pensacola. Where we were in uh, Middle Tennessee was even worse than that. The Nashville area. I mean, it, it, I, don't, I don't think it would be unrealistic to say hundreds 
of Churches of Christ within Middle Tennessee. Maybe within the whatever county Nashville's in. Philippians 127. Only let your conduct be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. It's not hard to understand. One mind, one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. There are not multiple, there are not, well, (laughs) there are not multiple true gospels. There are various gospels, aren't there? Isn't that what Paul wrote to the Galatians? I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who uh, brought you to the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Galatians 1, 6. But then he says this in verse 7, which is not another. But there are those who would pervert the gospel of Christ. They trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So just like it's true that there are many churches, there are many gospels out there. But there's only one true gospel. And as we were talking about earlier, there's only one way to properly interpret that gospel. To a lot of people in the religious world and I guess you might say in the secular world as well, that's a very, when they hear that, that is extremely arrogant, isn't it? And, and here you go, here's, here's one that has been thrown out. Oh, so you think you're the only ones going to heaven. You Church of Christ people, that's what you think. You know, the Bible tells me who's going to heaven. I've done this with you before. The Bible tells you who's going to heaven, doesn't it? Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 7, 21. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. But you have to have the discernment to know what that will is. And and for one thing, you can't be ignorant of it. Remember, what talking about the various drivers of division. Ignorance is a big one. There's no excuse to be ignorant of God's will because he's written it down for you. And you can handle it properly, otherwise he wouldn't tell us to handle it properly. Not every belief is the same. I want to show you this passage. Oh, well, let me say this first. Divi- so, and I mentioned this earlier, division is not the right word to use, because sometimes division is necessary, isn't it? Uh, I'll just give you one example. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. Mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them, knowing that such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by smooth words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. What is that other than division? You identify who who those people are and you avoid them because they're not serving God. If you know the truth, you can identify error, can't you? And, and John talks about that in 1 John chapter 4. Uh, brethren, 1 John 4, 1, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Division's the not, not, division is not the right word to use here, because sometimes division is necessary. All right, now, final click. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. This is the account where Jesus is casting out demons. And it is witnessed by the scribes and Pharisees, particularly the Pharisees. They're mentioned by name in verse 12, but uh, verse 24 rather. But the whole group is there. He's casting out demons. Verse 24, the Pharisees heard it and they said, This fellow doth not cast out demons but by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. Well, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. That makes no sense. The accusation against Christ was completely foolish, wasn't it? But it gets to a point here, and it's verse 30. And so that's the context, the casting out of demons, the the false accusations, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that's this context. But there's a principle here that applies to what we're talking about. He that is not with me is against me. And he who gathers not with me scatters abroad. 
There is truth and there is error. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. There is the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Isn't that what Jesus said in John 17, 17? So there's truth, and there can be many errors, many things taught that are wrong. But if you're not with him, you're against him. There's no third lane here. There's no other option. If you're, if you're not with him, you're against him. If you're not gathering together with him, you're scattering abroad. When I think about <clears throat> the religious world, the division that exists, when I think about even within the churches of Christ, the division that exists, that is not part of the will of God. Sectarianism, following a certain party, a certain group, a certain preacher. Every, and you've heard me say this before too. Every one of us has a favorite preacher. My favorite preacher is not me. And I bet that's probably true for many of you too. You've got your favorite preacher. I probably know who Jamie's favorite preacher was. And others like that. Well, we need to be dedicated to the truth. Not our own party, not our own sect. We need to be dedicated to truth and to doing what God would have us do. Not what we think is right, not what we feel is right, because again, there is truth and there is error. And there's a right way to handle the Word of God, and there are many wrong ways to handle the Word of God. And so we have to be those workmen who are not ashamed because we're properly handling the Word of truth. So, again, I, I, I guess I kind of, my goal was to lay a foundation for what we're going to continue to study in this particular series. And uh, I hope that it's beneficial to you because we. It doesn't matter how long you've been a member of the Lord's church. We need to be reminded of these things. That, you know, that's what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, I know you know these things, but as long as I'm alive in this body, I'm going to keep on bringing them back to your mind. We need to be firmly established in the truth. We need to grow deeper and, and, and uh, expand our biblical knowledge beyond the fundamentals, but we need to be strong in the fundamentals too. Particularly in our world of pluralism. And relativism, pluralism, one religion, one truth is as good as another. Well, that's just not true. Try that in any other realm of existence, and you know it's not true. You can be a member of the body of Christ if you'll come to Jesus. But that's, I quoted earlier, John chapter 14, beginning in verse, well, with verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. If you're here today and you're not yet a member of the singular body of Christ, the church for which he shed his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28, you can become a member of that body. You can have your sins washed away, and like those people in Acts chapter 2, those who gladly received his word were baptized, and the Lord added in the church daily those who were being saved. If that's your need today, we'll help you. If you have questions, you want to study, we'll be happy to do that with you too. Maybe you're here today and you've obeyed the gospel like that in the past, but you've not maintained your faithfulness. You've strayed. Maybe there's sin in your life as a Christian, and you need to make that right. We're here to do whatever we can to help you, and if you'll come forward right now as we stand and sing, we'll be happy to do that.